In the last class, we gave you the basic result of the Michelson Morley experiment. Um, after doing a few equations, we just sort of hand waved our way to saying, well, they didn't detect any shift when they were doing the interferometry. Um, and so, therefore, uh, w and the shift would have been when they rotated the apparatus um, and the light would have been traveling a different uh, direction through the ether. Um, and so, therefore, because they didn't detect any shift in the interference pattern, they were able to conclude to the best of their ability that there was no ether. I'd like to go into a little more detail about the mathematics <clears throat> behind this experiment. Step back and remember that we were finding the time difference between the two paths, right? So there's a path one, which is um, traveling to one mirror, and a path two, which is traveling to the other mirror. So path one and path two. And we found the time difference between these two paths if uh, considering the ether was traveling in along one direction or another. It doesn't really matter which direction it was traveling along, but <clears throat> I think in this case, the ether we said was traveling, whoops, was traveling this way at V, right? So that's the ether. And the light itself is traveling at C relative to the ether. So that's the speed of light relative to its own reference frame. Okay. So what we found is this time difference, and you can go back and review that. Um, but then we said, okay, so the fact that there's a time difference between the two legs is not what's important. It's what we're, what we're looking for is to change something. We're looking for a shift in the interference pattern, which is seen on the screen. And so what they changed is they rotated the apparatus by 90 degrees. So now think about it. If one leg is behind the other by a certain amount of time, if you're traveling along one axis, let's say it's behind by, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's two microseconds or two milliseconds or two seconds, but let's just say it's behind by two seconds. Then if you rotate the apparatus, then the leg that was behind by two seconds is now ahead by two seconds. So the shift in the time difference when you rotate the apparatus is four seconds. It was behind by two seconds and now it's ahead by two seconds, right? T2 and T1 are changing place. Um, and so, therefore, the total, the shift, <coughs> excuse me, um, between the amount of time it takes to go path one and path two is four seconds. And so we should see a shift in the interference pattern of the screen um, equivalent to a uh, four second shift. Okay. And that is assuming, of course, that there, that V is, uh, that's not assuming V is non-zero, but that's, that's true. And if V is zero, look at this equation, and if V is zero, then what we're going to get is, what's delta T if V is zero? Look at this equation and tell me what is the value of delta T if there is no ether? If there is no ether, delta T is zero. So only if we can detect a non-zero delta T can we assume there's an ether? That means only if we can detect a shift in the interference pattern, is there an ether? Or at least, right, there's going to be a lower bound. You can never measure a zero in science. Okay, so, so we went on and we said, well, okay, so if we, um, if we rotate the thing 90 degrees, then we're going to have a total time shift of that. And if we can assume that C is much, much larger than V, we can assume that... Um, that the, uh, the one wave will fall behind the other by a total time difference of 2 delta t. It'll fall behind the other, therefore, by a distance of distance equals rate times time, c times 2 delta v, c times 2 delta v. Okay, so I just want, what I want to do is look at, um, look at, uh, let's take, take this one. Let's forget about delta d because you might be concerned by the fact that we only multiplied by c here, not c plus v or c minus v or something like that. Um, so let's go ahead and just look at uh, 2 delta t, which is definitely, uh, there was no approximation there. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to do a mathematical manipulation here, which, um, you know, this is, which is a special case for this situation, but is actually a mathematical manipulation that we are going to do over and over again when we talk about special relativity. So it's, it's you. Uh, I don't know what just happened. Sorry, I'm going to restate that. Um, we're going to do a mathematical manipulation that uh, is a useful mathematical man manipulation that we're going to do over and over again in relativity. So what we do here is not just for this situation. 
Okay, so what I want to do <clears throat> is recognize that c, the, uh, the value of the speed of light, must be much, much greater than v. It must be much, much greater than v. Why must it be much, much greater than v? If it wasn't much, much greater than v, then we, we wouldn't have to do experiments like this. Um, if, if v was, was near c, then, then it, it, this would be an easily measurable um, effect, and we'd be able to see differences in speed of light. Um, if, if V was that big. And of course, we know C is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And we're looking for V. If V is 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, that means that light should be traveling at 5 times 10 to the 8th meters per second in some directions, and at 1 times 10 to the 8th meters per second in other directions. It would be a very measurable thing. So the fact that we haven't yet been able to measure it tells us that C must be much, much greater than V. In other words, V is a small number relative to 3 times 10 to the 8th. And so what that means is that that actually does make our lives a little easier when it comes to mathematics. Um, and so what we want to write is we want to write, um, we want to simplify things. Um, 2 delta t, which is the total time difference when we get a shift, we want to write things in terms of v over c. Because v, and, the re, and you'll see in a second, because v over c, therefore v over c, must be much, much less than 1. If we divide both sides by c, that tells us v over c must be much, much, bleh, must be much, much less than 1. Okay, so let's see what this means for the equation in the green box. Okay, 2, and we've got 2L, and what I want to do on the bottom is factor out a c squared, and then that comes out of the square root, so that's a c, right? We've got a c times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, so again, make sure you understand that step. That's a really important step. You're probably going to be asked to even do it on an exam. Oops, hold on. So all we did there was we factored a c squared out of the stuff inside the square root, and then we took the square root of it so we could factor a c out. And then we're going to do the same to the other fraction. So first, with the fraction on the right-hand side, all I, was, all I did, I just did algebra. Make sure you can see this algebra. Looking for a common denominator, the common denominator um, is c squared minus v squared, and in order to do that algebra, so I haven't um, factored out anything yet, I'm just combining the two with a common denominator, and so we get 2lc over c squared minus v squared. So then that, rather than me going to a new page, we can write that as 2l c over c squared and factor that c squared out so we get 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, that's just that second term. Okay, so, oops, I think that was a 2, not a c, 2lc. Factor out the c squared off the bottom so that we have that uh, 1 minus v squared over c squared. So now I'm going to rewrite this on the next page. Do note, I'm going to just note right here, that there's a 2L over C here, and this is also 2L over C. So I can factor out a 2L over C. And so what we end up getting is 2 delta T, which is the total time difference. I'm just, I, rather than writing a different delta T, we just can keep writing 2 delta T, which is the total time difference when we rotate the Michelson Morley apparatus 90 degrees, is equal to 2L over C times, not the square root, times 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared plus 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Is that a plus? It is not a plus, it's a minus. Okay, that's just copied from the other page. Two, oh, I, left, I've, I lost a factor of 2. There's a factor of 2 right here. Uh, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, two oh, yeah, it looks right. Okay, so that should be another 2 right there. So therefore, 2 delta t is equal to, let's see, 4L over c. Now, we need to simplify what's in here. Now remember, this is what's important, is that v over c is much, much less than 1. Now, if v over c is much, much less than 1, we can simplify um, with no loss, really no loss of accuracy, we can simplify 1 minus v squared over c squared to be, here, let me, we need to do an aside. We need to do an aside. 
binomial, what's called the binomial approximation. This is the important part that I was saying that we're just going to do this over and over again. We're going to try to write things in terms of sort of terms like this, and we're always going to do, do the binomial approximation because we really don't lose any generality because V over C must be so small.